Welcome to MS Monthly Reports. I'm Alex Raygrant, Director of Education for the Mellon Center for Multiple Sclerosis at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm delighted this month to introduce Dr. Sarosh Sharani, who will be talking about the emerging and exciting topic of autoimmune encephalitis. Dr. Irani is a consultant neurologist and clinician scientist at Oxford University. Dr. Irani is a major force in the recognition and understanding of antigenic targets in patients with encephalitis and epilepsy. He has been one of the leading lights in identifying novel autoantibodies, most notably LGI-1, and describing their unique role in human neurological disease. In this activity, he will review autoimmune encephalitis leading us to a better understanding of this group of emerging neuroimmune conditions. Dr. Irani. My name is Suresh Irani. I'm a neurologist and a uh, clinician scientist working at Oxford University, and I've got an interest in autoimmune encephalitis. Um, so I'm going to tell you today about autoimmune encephalitis as an emerging new immune condition. And maybe it's emerged, and maybe we know a lot about it already. Um, and I'm going to present a lot of the data that we have. I'm also going to show you some of the questions that we're interested in, which might be areas um, which are emerging. And today I'm going to try and achieve three learning objectives to talk about methods for detecting the disease-relevant neuronal autoantibodies, which are really the diagnostic key to many of these diseases. But of course, the true diagnosis relies on a correlation between those and the clinical features, investigation features and treatment responses, and then the generalizability of these findings to other neurological disease diseases, um, and I'll come on to those in a bit more detail. We're interested in um, a number of types of antibodies which have appeared over the last few years, but the key is this transition that you see on this slide from antibodies which are detected by immunohistochemistry and Western blots. Immunohistochemistry allows detection of intracellular antibody targets. So the antibodies can bind to the cut section and bind to cytoplasmic or nuclear elements. The western blot, of course, requires denatured antigen. And again, you're then now you're binding to linear epitopes, which are often not shaped in the right conformation. Sometimes we call these conformationally native. Um, in the, they're not in the right conformation for the antibody to see them in vivo and to represent the molecule in vivo. And so people often find lots of false positives on a Western blot, antibodies that aren't disease relevant. And then we've moved more to having the antigen in its as native state as possible, either um, radio label typically, um, and that's the radio immunoassay there in a detergent solution maybe, or on the surface of a cell, a mammalian cell in its native fashion. So what we've really moved from is denatured intracellular antibody detection to detection of surface expressed antigens with native conformations. And therefore, the antibodies are likely to target their and access their protein in vivo. And if you don't know the antibody target, you can do rat brain sections with this sort of typical secondary immunohistochemical approach. And those detect, as we said, intracellular and extracellular antibodies. But more and more, we're detecting extracellular only antibodies by asking neurons in culture, we're asking patients' antibodies which neurons in culture they'd like to bind and whether they'd like to bind the outside of those live neurons. You can see here a picture where the neuron is in red, but what we've got here is this beautiful speckled staining of the patient's antibodies in green to the outside of that neuron. Therefore, this patient has an antibody which targets a neuronal surface protein, an NSAB, sometimes we call them. However, we don't know its target yet. So you could then run a cell-based assay for LGI-1 or CASPA-2 or NMDA receptors. And if it's none of those, we still know the patient has a surface targeting antibody. So I think these are really interesting observations to make and um, can often infer the patient has an antibody without necessarily knowing the target. And indeed, a number of targets are now known. So there's on this table, you can see LGI-1 antibodies, NMDA, GABA-B, CASPA-2, so on and so forth. And they associate with slightly different syndromes, typically. I'm interested in LGI-1 and the NMDA receptor. And indeed, these are the two commonest diseases. So I'm going to focus on those for most of this talk. So the VGKC antibodies used to be known as VGKC antibodies, but in fact, they should be known as VGKC complex antibodies because 
from the brain membranes from which they're extracted and then labeled with the dendrotoxin, iodinated dendrotoxin molecule, they don't actually bind the potassium channel. They, in fact, bind proteins neighboring the potassium channel. This animation shows CASPER2 binding, but they can also bind LGI1. And these are their real targets. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the antibody mediators, um, the diseases associated with these antibodies. More LGI1 than CASPER2 in the central nervous system. Of course, you'll have heard of neuromyotonia, which, which is a peripheral nerve hyperexcitability disease. And this occurs with CASPER2 antibodies more than LGI1 antibodies. And indeed, with VGKC complex antibodies in the central nervous system, more commonly LGI1. And this disease was typically described as an encephalitis, although many patients don't have features of inflammation. But most patients are in their later life. The disease comes on over days or weeks with amnesia, frequent seizures, a low rate of neoplasms. This is unusually paraneoplastic, a serum hyponatremia, a normal spinal fluid examination, and an MRI, which is abnormal in about 60% of cases, with this very typical hippocampal and amygdala high signal. And indeed, the first few papers showed that if you treat patients with these diseases, their antibody levels can drop precipitously. On the, on, on, the, on the left there, as you're looking, figure B, you'll see that the antibody levels drop fast if they're given steroids and IVIG and treated early. If they're treated a bit later, their levels drop more slowly. But the level, the fall in the level correlates well with an improvement in their memory. So we think that this is good evidence in patients that the antibodies are causing the disease. However, more recently, we've begun to see patients who have a different syndrome, who have um, pure seizure syndrome associated with these antibodies. Indeed, we first found them in the patients with the encephalitis, but more and more we're seeing them in isolation. These seizures we've named fascia brachial dystonic seizures, as they typically affect the face and the arm. There's a prominent dystonic component to them, and they're frequent, they're very brief, they're associated with LGI1 antibodies, and they come on in adults. There are some features associated with individual attacks which are consistent with seizures. For example, vocalizations, sensory um, shock or warm or uh, migratory sensory sensations, typically in the epigastrium, a speech arrest, autonomic features, a loss of awareness in about two-thirds of patients during any one episode. But the episodes are so frequent that it's a very small number of the episodes that are associated with a loss of awareness. Falls, um, auditory or, or tactile stimulus sens sensitivity, agitation, fidgetiness afterwards. And indeed, many of these features are consistent with um, a, a, a form of seizures, and a few patients have e ictal EEG changes, which are also consistent with seizures. So we believe these are seizures. However, there's prominent involvement of the basal ganglia on multimodal imaging methods, as you can see from this slide, and therefore it raised the possibility that these are basal ganglia attacks, which have some features of seizures. But the clinically important features are as follows. So one of the important features is that the fasciobrachial dystonic seizures, the FBDS, tend to precede cognitive impairment in about 60 to 70% of cases. So in these patients, there seems to be a stereotype procession from seizures, often increasing in frequency until cognitive impairment occurs. In the other patients, on the lower half of the graph, the cognitive impairment comes first, but the FBDS are often so specific and so distinctive that they give you the clue that this must be an LGI1 antibody mediated disease. And as you can see from this extra comment, five patients have no cognitive impairment, which is interesting, and I'll come on to that now. Because when we selected patients based on the presence of FPDS and LGI1 antibodies, their response to anti-epileptics was poor compared to their response to addition of immunotherapy. So anti-epileptics, a median of two, given for a median of 30 days, cause only one patient to have a reduction in their seizures, as you'll see from that figure on the left. However, when antiepileptics were added to immunotherapy or the immunotherapies actually were added in, the effect was dramatic and most people's seizures stopped. And if you plot this in a Kaplan-Meier format in the second graph, you'll see that seizures really stopped in these patients quite dramatically, often before three or four weeks, Whereas with anti-epileptics alone, that did not happen. So the treatment of the seizures may prevent the onset of cognitive impairment. And this is a finding from the same study, 
we found that from those 10 patients, five already presented with cognitive impairment before treatment, but five presented with no cognitive impairment at presentation and an ACE R, so a cognitive assessment, which was essentially in the normal range. They were given one to three anti-epileptics and three who had no immunotherapy developed cognitive impairment. And interestingly, the two who had immunotherapy developed no cognitive impairment that we could detect on that score. So I think this is very interesting. I think we are in a position to say that these diseases are, um, I think we're in a position to say that this is a small study, but it was prospective, it was carefully conducted. And I think we have some evidence that treating these seizures early is a benefit not just to the seizures, but to the prevention of an impending cognitive syndrome. And this is the sort of paradigm we end up with. Can we prevent the cognitive disability and the atrophy, which previous work has shown is a consequence of limbic encephalitis? And therefore, can we prevent some cases of adult onset medial temporal lobe sclerosis? And I think we possibly can. So what's the pathophysiology underlying this? Well, it's very complex with LGI1 antibodies. And to my mind, no study has addressed this clearly because there are multiple potential mechanisms. One is a direct interaction of the IgG with um, the LGI1 protein, and does that influence ADAM22, ADAM23, the presynaptic potassium channel, the postsynaptic AMPA receptor? There is evidence from this Japanese paper that it affects the AMPA receptor, but does it affect the others as well? And indeed, the only post-mortem evidence we have is of IgG deposition and complement deposition. So we know that's a mechanism, and that's an important thing to bear in mind. So which of the following are correct regarding NMDA receptor antibodies is my next question and is the topic which I'm going to come on to now. So NMDA receptor antibodies were first described in young women with ovarian teratomas. And this is an immunotherapy responsive condition associated with antibodies against the ubiquitous NR1 subunit of the NMDA receptor. The figure here shows a teratoma. You can see different types of tissue in there, stromal, um, maybe vascular, um, and so on, and you can see that in, in, black, in brown here, those are neurons with the NMDA receptor stained, um, stained up. So the receptor is expressed within the tissue. And it must be the source of immunization in those patients. And the patients follow a very stereotyped set of clinical features, a progression, starting with psychiatric, neuropsychiatric features and seizures, going on to movement disorders, consciousness disruption, gaze deviation, dysautonomia, and sleep seems to be prominently affected both in the early stage in red with hypersomnia and in the later stage in blue with insomnia. And these two stages fall out in terms of test results as well, where you have an early lymphocytosis, early absence of oligoclonal bands with a later generation, early epileptiform potentials, later slowing, and some suggestion of MRI changes which also move from cortical to subcortical um, features. And the treatments are very interesting. So patients given these treatments respond over time. The patients who respond to first-line drugs, which are steroids, IVIG, and or plasma exchange, do well, clearly. By definition, the first-line non-responders do more poorly. But importantly, the patients who had first-line and nothing else in figure C do much worse than the patients who had first line plus a second line, which is in this case rituximab and cyclophosphamide in figure D. So multiple treatments help, and there's a suggestion that early treatments also help. Treatments also reduce the rate of relapses. So this is an important thing for the future. Are we treating our patients adequately enough for the future? And this is the sort of data we have. Without treatment, your two-year relapse rate is 20 to 25%, and with treatment, you're down to about 10%. And this is probably the disease in which we have the best examples of um, histology and of tissue demonstration and behavioral demonstrations of antibody pathogenicity. So here, patient CSF has been infused into mice brains. And over 18 days, you can see that deposit. The, the pump is turned off at day 14. And then you can see the IgG is removed. You can see that this is a disruption of the NMDA receptor without much, dis much disruption in associated proteins such as PSD95. And maybe this 
wash out of IgG explains the reversibility of these diseases. But the animals didn't have atrophy, they didn't have complement deposition, they had no psychosis, seizures, or movement disorder. So there are some aspects which, although partly mimic the patient's disease, are not necessarily intuitive pathophysiologically. There's also a very interesting story emerging about post-infectious NMDA receptor antibodies, where kids who develop a relapse after HSV will develop a relapse which often has choreoathetosis and an encephalopathy. And although at onset they'll have a typical CT or MRI for HSV, they'll have PCR positivity in their CSF, they'll not have NMDA receptor antibodies. However, when they develop their relapse, those antibodies will have developed and they'll be negative for the CSF PCR, suggesting that they, they have HSV and then go on to develop NMDA receptor encephalitis. And traditionally, these patients have not responded well to acyclovir in the relapse, whereas they have in the first episode. So this is a really interesting paradigm. Probably does not describe molecular mimicry because there are multiple antibodies produced, but one of them that we can easily measure is the NMDA receptor antibody. I promised you I wouldn't talk about it, but I'm just going to mention the glycine receptor antibody syndrome because I think it's very distinctive and clinically important, as again, it's immunotherapy responsive. These patients often have a stiff person syndrome spectrum disorder, often called PERM or progressive encephalomyelitis with rigidity and myoclonus, PERM. And these patients have spasms and stiffness and rigidity, often axially, just like the stiff people but they often have an ocular motor disturbance. They can have other brainstem features, including a startle response. They can have a dysautonomia, and some of them can have cognitive impairment and respiratory impairment. And this is a new disease, really, because it's been put on the map um, in the context of the antibody. Although, of course, the clinical descriptions were recognized beforehand, I think the antibody has really emphasized the um, detection rate of these features and also has prompted people to give immunotherapy. Also, there are now at least three antibodies to the GABA receptors. GABA B receptor antibodies associated with small cell lung cancer, and GABA A receptor antibodies are much less frequently par uh, paraneoplastic and can come in a variety of specificities depending on the heteromeric composition of the GABA A receptor, the alpha, beta, and gamma subunit compositions. So, one of the big questions is, is there a generalizability of these syndromes? Is it that these antibodies are present just in these patients who have unusual forms of epilepsy or unusual forms of cognitive impairment? Or is it that this is generalizable? So I think there is evidence for both. I think in the epilepsies, there's clear evidence that a few patients have these antibodies and they have a preferentially immunotherapy responsive syndrome. However, some of them definitely still respond to anti-epileptic drugs, and those must not be forgotten in the management of these patients. With psychosis, I think it's considered more controversial. Some groups feel that there are no NMDA receptor antibodies in patients with schizophrenia or patients with a first episode psychosis. Others feel they are, they are there, and further studies are ongoing to determine their relevance. So, in summary, neuronal surface antibodies associate with characteristic clinical features typically. These are often immunotherapy responsive diseases, and year by year we are seeing more and more neuronal surface antibodies. Important future questions are will the evidence become um, stronger to allow us to base treatments on it? Will there be randomized trials? Will there be more antibodies? And will these antibodies generalize to other common and neurological conditions? And I hope you um, enjoyed the talk. Thanks, Dr. Irani, for an elegant and comprehensive session. Over the past decade, autoimmune encephalitis has gone from an under-recognized, indeed often unrecognized problem, to one where we can readily characterize specific antigens and neural targets. In our ICU, we are now making the diagnosis of LGI-1 encephalitis at presentation, thanks to your team's work on the clinical and laboratory identification of this unique syndrome. We now know to look for this and other autoimmune encephalitides in the appropriate clinical setting. Moreover, we now recognize potentially good outcomes for patients with NMDAR encephalitis and other autoantibody-mediated conditions. We know that persistent, thoughtful treatment may make the difference between life and death for patients affected by these conditions.